May I propose that I recall that after careful consideration, the considered view of the committee was that while they considered that the proposal met with broad approval in principle, <laughs> that some of the principles were sufficiently fundamental in principle and some of the considerations so complex and finely balanced in practice. They were impossibly difficult to learn. And Nigel was very macho about learning lines. Paul used to say, for God's sake, dear, just write it down somewhere. You know, here's a pad, put it here. But he wouldn't. Wouldn't. <laughs> Nigel got very tense uh, in the early episodes. And I remember he... I saw him taking a pill. And I said, what's that? He said, it's a beta blocker. I said, oh, give me one. I'll take anything, you know. And I didn't know where I was. I was so spaced out. But it, Nigel said it helped him enormously. He took one, and this was the beginning of the second series, and I was astonished because I turned around, like he wasn't in a particular scene, turned around and found him sitting in the audience, chatting to everybody around. I thought, he's out of his mind on beta blockers. What are we going to do here? But anyway, from that moment on, he never needed to take them again, but he always carried them, and that kind of solved a great problem for him. I was quite horrified to find well into the series um, that Nigel still remembered every word of every long speech. Uh, I thought, we, you know, here's a man with a decent brain which we're cluttering up with all this junk. <laughs> it is characteristic of all committee discussions and decisions that every member has a vivid recollection of them and that every member's recollection of them differs violently from every other member's recollection. <laughs> Consequently, we accept the convention that the official decisions are those and only those which have been officially recorded in the minutes by the officials, from which it emerges with an elegant inevitability that any decision which has been officially reached will have been officially recorded in the minutes by the officials, and any decision which is not recorded in the minutes has not been officially reached, even if one or more members believe they can recollect it. So in this particular case, if the decision had been officially reached, it would have been officially recorded in the minutes by the officials, and it isn't, so it wasn't. <laughs> Told you so. <laughs> but the programme's famous verbal diarrhoea was often stymied by even more sublime scenes that were practically monosyllabic. I'm appalled. You're appalled. I'm appalled. I just can't believe it. I'm... I'm appalled. What do you make of it, Bernard? I'm appalled. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. Appalled. It's appalling. <laughs> appalling, I, I, I just don't know how to describe it. Appalling? <laughs> appalling. The next reason was the classic opening title sequence. The music was fairly serious and posh. It didn't have the traditional <laughs> of sitcom theme tunes. But what set the titles apart were the drawings by Gerald Scarf, which indicated that something was amiss, something was strangely distorted and hats off to the cast for allowing themselves to look absolutely hideous. Gerald Scott is a genius and, uh, and a, a brilliant man. He has this marvellous power to, to do what we were trying to do, which was really massive distortion that is still amazingly recognisable. I devised this way of actually drawing under the camera. I would draw a tiny bit of line, take two frames of film, click, click, another bit of line, click, click, and so on. And when, of course, when you ran the film at normal speed, it all built up, the drawing built up in front of you. Paul had this big beak. And Nigel had this, you know, this long face. I think I have this curved nose with these things under my eyes. I wanted to buy the original, but uh, couldn't afford it. The extraordinary thing is, um, I give a series of talks around the country, and I've worked with Walt Disney and Pink Floyd and so forth, all quite big hitters, but the thing people remember most of all is Yes Minister. The next reason for nominating Yes Minister is its tremendous authenticity. Jonathan Lynn and Anthony Jay based their stories on secret information passed on to them by Whitehall insiders, some of whom were as well placed as Watergate's deep throat. So not only was it funny, it was true. You couldn't say that about Blackadder.
What I always puzzled about was where Anthony Jay really got his uh, civil service approach and language from. He must have done an enormous research among civil servants. The higher they are, the less discreet they are. Low-level civil servants are worried about losing their jobs. MPs, well, they're very low-level, but they don't know anything anyway, so you know, they're not really relevant. But high-level civil servants and high-level political advisors and cabinet me members uh, will tell you anything if you take them out to a good lunch and give them a couple of glasses, well, no, three or four glasses of claret. They'll tell you pretty much anything you want to know. There was a secret sauce which Tony Jay and Jonathan then had, and they used to whip up there with a boot full of claret uh, to various places in Smith Square. I, I, I know who they're talking about, but unfortunately I cannot tell you. My life is not worth it. Well, I am willing to be beaten up and left for dead by thugs with briefcases, as this programme reveals for the first time just how well-placed those sources were. There were two sources who we always talk to and then there were several reasons for keeping their names quiet the most important reason was that they were both powerful political advisors during the Wilson or Callaghan government one was Marcia Falcon uh, who'd been Harold Wilson's private secretary they'd bring the scripts to me at my home and uh, um, we sat we spent the morning working on it and uh, laughing about it too and, and uh, generally making a, a, a scene. And Bernard Donoghue, who had been the head of the policy unit for Wilson and for, for Callaghan. For years and years and years, I never told anyone I worked uh, on it with them. I think it helped the whole mystery and credibility of it that they seem to have inside sources. They said, you know, it can't become public. And I said, no, of course not. Because at that time, politicians were very, very scrupulous about not talking about anything to anybody. No one quite knew who were the deep throats. Because Yes Minister is like documentary truth, it's devastating. We're laughing at peculiar plots and bizarre behaviour, but it actually happened to our actual MPs. Quite a number of the scenarios for Yes Minister series were based on actual events, certainly which I experienced. Uh, there was, uh, but they always added something. I mean, there was one about when we went on a visit to Pakistan and uh, there were no drinks allowed and how we uh, uh, pretended that we had to have an office immediately outside the reception to communicate with number 10 where we had uh, large bottles of very brown orange juice because whiskey had been put in it and they used that. Quite so. Oh, excuse me, Minister, there's an urgent call for you in the communications room, a uh, Mr. Haig. <laughs> I don't know whether it's OK to say, I think I probably still shouldn't, um, but it happened to an ex it, with a very, very well-known British politician on, a, on an official visit to a Muslim country. Yes, yes. Wanted in the communications room, Mr John Walker. <laughs> Johnny Walker? <laughs> yes, from the Scotch office. <laughs> Scottish office. That's an example of the kind of thing that we would not have thought of if we'd just sat at home trying to make up stories and be funny. It was only because we were out and about and asking questions uh, that we were able to find out about that and numerous other bizarre things that really happen in government. Yes, the Soviet embassy is on the line, Sir Humphrey and Mr Smirnoff. <laughs> Sure, there isn't one for me. Oh, well, there was a message from the British Embassy compound, the school, a delegation of teachers. Oh. <laughs> Let's go and greet the teachers. <laughs> yes. 
before the bells goes. <laughs> Bell goes. The next reason may seem like a pretty obvious one. It's the studio audience. It would have been really easy to play up the realism in Yes Minister and play down the comedy. But having the audience there forced the writers to take their skills to a higher level. And in the end, they constructed a sitcom that was every bit as funny and as satisfying as anything set in a hotel or an office. And of course, what better protection against your opponents who'd love to have you taken off air than the sounds of millions laughing? I mean, it was recorded in front of a studio audience on Sunday evenings. We'd be there all day at camera rehearsing, and then they would all come in, 250 people. And uh, none, of, none, none of us really enjoyed that, uh, because it was a pressure that we felt we could do without. Professor Henderson might drop in to have a cup of tea with his provost. That'd be a happy coincidence, wouldn't it, Brian? Oh, uh, Brian? <laughs> There were two reasons why we absolutely had to have the audience. The first is that because we weren't playing obvious jokes in the way that a lot of situation comedies do, we actually needed, I believe, that you need an audience on the soundtrack because comedy is a communal thing. Laughing is a communal affair. I don't think we want to drag through all that again. <laughs> the more important reason, and the real reason for an audience being essential for Yes, Minister and yes, Prime Minister, was that it was insurance. There's always a risk if you do political comedy that somebody in Whitehall will have a word with somebody at the BBC. If there's no audience, they can just say, well, this is some smart people being clever at the expense of our great democratic system um, and, uh, and put pressure on the BBC to, to say, you know, do you really want to run this sort of nonsense? I mean, it doesn't do anybody any good, does it? If an audience of 250 people is falling about with laughter, they can't say that. <laughs> yes, Minister, never treated its audience like morons, and it's hard to imagine a programme as wordy and as static, sitting comfortably in today's schedules, in between celebrity arse swap and kettles from hell. In today's five-second teen culture, in which the camera has to keep moving in case a viewer drops dead of boredom. A programme in which three middle-aged men talk about MOD personnel displacement would be thrown to the lions after the first week. Yes, Minister raised the bar for comedy and it wasn't afraid to be intelligent about how it got its laughs. Morning, Minister. Humphrey, do you see it as part of your job to help ministers make fools of themselves? Well, I've never met one that needed any help. <laughs> the public is a lot more intelligent than a lot of people think they are. A lot of TV shows, especially situation comedies, talk down to the public and patronise them. Well, what are we going to do about Ron Jones's peerage? Give him one too? With respect, Prime Minister, we can't send two Lord Ron Jones to the upper house. It'll look like a job lot. <laughs> Give him something, I promised. Well, what's he interested in? Does he watch television? He hasn't even got a set. Fine, make him a governor of the BBC. <laughs> Anything else? We believe that the audience were just as intelligent as we were, but there might be some things they didn't know, and so we'd make it, you know, absolutely um, imperative that they should know it, and we'd find ways of giving them the necessary information that they hadn't got. But having given them that, we assume they'd laugh at what we laughed at, and it seemed to work. Well, take the Foreign Office. First you get the CMG, then the KCMG, then the GCMG. The Commander of the Order of St Michael and St George, Knight Commander of St Michael and St George, Knight Grand Cross of St Michael and St George. Of course, in the service, CMG stands for Call Me God. <laughs> and uh, the KCMG for Kindly Call Me God. <laughs> what does GCMG stand for? God Calls Me God. 